whisper of a whisper peace, of moving peace, through the land. Through Allah the land. will surely Allah run to us, but, to but do we understand? A word of hope will call to everyone. And I don't need to introduce our speakers, and I don't need to keep you waiting as well. I want to hand over the microphone to our esteemed scholar. Ali Ustad Ali Amuda, he will address us and then Mufti goes next after him, Bismillah. Alhamdulillahi wahdahu wa salatu wa salam ala man la nabiyya ba'dahu wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Just a few minutes of your time, dear brothers and sisters, to introduce the concept behind this discussion, what will be a 3D dynamic discussion between us. Regret is one of the most painful emotions that can affect really any one of us, Muslim or non-Muslim alike. I was reading not too long ago in the Harvard newsletter of a man, an elderly gentleman in Liverpool from the UK who would pull out the same lottery number each week, hoping to hit the jackpot. SubhanAllah, despite his old age, there is still that desire and the hope to become a multimillionaire one day without the need to work with it. And this is the nature of man, as the Messenger وسلم, said, that man grows and two things continue to grow with him forever. And one of them is the love of dunya. So every week he would come out with the same lottery number. And on one particular week, by the Qadr of Allah, he forgot to renew those numbers and his numbers came up. And so when he came to learn of this, he found no way to deal with the overwhelming sense of regret that he was engulfed by other than to claim his life. He committed suicide. It's a very sad story. We would have hoped that Islam could have been introduced to him before that so that he would find solace there. But this is the qadr of Allah Jalla Jalalu. The point being, regret is something that we really struggle to deal with. And had Allah Jalla Jalalu not given us the coping mechanisms to deal with it in the life of this world as Muslims, we could have been in the same situation as our friend from Liverpool. One of the Names of Yawmul Qiyamah, the day of judgment, is Yawmul Hasra, the day of regret. Allah says, وَأَنذِرْهُمْ يَوْمَ الْحَسْرَ إِذْ قُضِيَ الْأَمْرُ وَهُمْ فِي غَفْلَةٍ وَهُمْ لَا يُؤْمِنُونَ Warn them of the day of regret. Warn them of the day of regret. The non-Muslim man will be in a state of regret for not being a Muslim. And the Muslim man and the Muslim woman will be in a state of regret for not being a better Muslim. We will be in a state of regret. With this short introduction, I would like to ask a question, which is, how can we protect ourselves from regret on the Day of Judgment? In other words, wouldn't it be so painful to meet Allah Jalla Jalaluhu on the Day of Standing and to see paradise, and to see the hellfire, and then you see your deeds. And what was once the ultimate meaning of success in your life, you now see it nothing but a regretfully wasted opportunity. And that will be the situation of a lot of us. Imagine revising for two years, three years, four years, theoretically speaking, for an exam, and then when you enter the examination theater, you realize that you are revising for the wrong exam. Imagine spending four years, five years, eight years studying to become a professional in a particular field, say medicine or architecture, only to find out that there is no demand for your field of expertise. Imagine spending years upon years of your life climbing up a ladder only then to discover that your ladder was leaning on the wrong wall. Now, what is the common denominator of all three of these examples? I'm sure you will agree with me that it is vision setting. If I had set for myself a clear vision and a plan, knowing who I am as a male, as a female, educated, uneducated, Arab, non-Arab, 
knowing who I am and then knowing where I am going, I would have protected myself from such a regretful outcome. Agreed? Agreed, dear brothers and sisters? Tayyib, so what is success? All of this really is an introduction to get to this one question. What, what is success? How could I be happy and offer Allah Jalla Jalaluhu a gift, a dowry of a hasana, a good deed, to justify my pleading for Jannah? How? How do I define what success? Is it in being a CEO of a company or a parliamentarian or an MC? And there can be elements of success in all, don't get me wrong. I am talking about the ultimate success. That we are smiling on a day when the majority of people will not be smiling. How can we define success? Here is a suggestion, dear brothers and sisters, just to get the conversation going. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala helps us answer this question. Allah says, focus with me. Kullu nafsin dha'iqatul mawt. Wa innama tuwaffawna ujurakum yawma al-qiyamah. فَمَنْ زُحْزِحَ عَنِ النَّارِ وَأُدْخِلَ الْجَنَّةَ فَقَدْ فَازِ وَمَا الْحَيَاةُ الدُّنْيَا إِلَّا مَتَاعُ الْغُرُورِ Every soul shall taste death. Allah mentions, and it is on the day of judgment where we are going to be recompensed for what we did in full. Listen carefully now, here is the definition of success according to Allah Jalla Jalaluh. He says, therefore whoever is pushed away from the hellfire and is given access into Jannah, such a person has succeeded. What is success? It is about glorifying Allah and entering into Jannah. What is success? Not falling into the pits of the hellfire. With that benchmark, dear brothers and sisters, allow it to inform your decisions in life. Allow it to help you find your strategy and your project, so that on Yom Al Qiyamah, us and our mothers and our fathers, and our children, will be smiling and will be happy, and we will not be in a state of regret. Sheikh uh, Ismail, tafadhal. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillahi wa ala alihi wa sahabihi ajma'in. I think very, very importantly, a purposeful life. Number one, we need to understand that primarily, as we always say, we worship Allah alone, we follow the footsteps of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, we must fulfill what Allah wants us to fulfill. Now, if we take a look at what Allah wants from us, we will realize there are two main things. Two main things that Allah wants us to fulfill. Number one is His rights, the rights of Allah. So I will worship Him alone as per the way He wants. I worship Him and I make sure that I don't go against his transgressions. He decides what's halal and haram. And I should be proud of being a person who is chosen to worship Allah. Subhanahu wa ta'ala. When we say proud here, we're talking of being happy. We're not talking of pride as in arrogance. But what's important to know is there will be challenges that we will face while we are trying to fulfill this duty. And these challenges are in the form of distractions in order for us to be tested who from amongst us is truthful and who is not truthful. So Allah says, أَحَسِبَ النَّاسُ أَن يُتْرَكُوا أَن يَقُولُوا آمَنَّا وَهُمْ لَا يُفْتَنُونَ وَلَقَدْ فَتَنَّ الَّذِينَ مِنْ قَبْلِهِمْ فَلَيَعْلَمَنَّ اللَّهُ الَّذِينَ صَدَقُوا وَلَيَعْلَمَنَّ الْكَاذِبِينَ Do the people think that it's enough for them to say, I'm a Muslim, and then they won't be tested? Allah says, we have tested those before them in order to distinguish between those who are truthful and those who are not, those who are false in that claim of Islam, Islam meaning the submission. So the second right or the second duty that we have, one is worshipping Allah, 
One is the right of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The second is the rights of the creatures of the same Allah who created us. So with me and with you, we tend to forget that Allah created others. Just like he loves me, he cares for me, he's going to provide for me, he will provide for them too. And he loves them and cares for them too. And he wants them to turn to him as well. A person leading their life for 70 years in the wrong direction can make a move in one moment that would elevate their rank higher than a person who was in the right direction for 70 years and made a wrong movement. So while we are worshipping Allah, we must fulfill the rights of the rest of the creation. Why did Allah create people who are going to be disbelievers? Well, for them it's a test, but for me, it's an even bigger test. What do I do about it? There are some who, whose knowledge is lacking so much and whose patience lacks so much that they want to attack and harm those whom they disagree with. But Allah created them. When Allah speaks of the rights of neighbors through the blessed lips of Muhammad sallallahu in the hadith, he tells us in his wording, he says, you know what? Your, your neighbor, if you believe in Allah in the last day, then don't harm your neighbor. And he speaks of the rights of neighbors who are Muslim, those who are not, those who are relatives, those who are near and distant, they all have rights. Your neighbor, a non-Muslim, your neighbor, a person who disagrees with you certain matters and their rights. Why? Because that's how you will get closer to Allah by understanding his power, his creation, his authority, his grandeur. That's Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Why did Allah create the pig and tell us that it's haram to consume? Why? Why did Allah create uh, the dogs and the monkeys and tell us you're not allowed to eat those? Why did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make the snakes when they are harmful? Why did Allah create the lions and the tigers when we know that it's dangerous? For a purpose, for a reason. He's the same Allah who made me, so I need to respect the rest of the creation of Allah, so much so that we as Muslims are not allowed to go out and start throwing stones at pigs just because they're pigs. We cannot just go and harm dogs just because they're dogs. No, they are the creatures of Allah. So this, that is one aspect of uh, our lives, to understand the two uh, duties that we have. One is unto, well, it's all unto Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but the rights of Allah and the rights of the rest of the creation and the rights more so of humankind as well. While trying to fulfill the obligations unto Allah, we will find that we will have, like I said earlier, distractions, obstacles, challenges. And sometimes when we don't control the heart and we don't realize that it needs to be put in its place, we tend to turn towards things that we're not supposed to turn towards because they are harmful. In the process, we tend to displease Allah. I'll give you an example. A person who's walking down the road and he sees someone with a beautiful motor vehicle and he really likes it and he wants it and he's so attracted by this beautiful car that he starts thinking for a month, two months, three months and then he realizes the best way of getting it is to steal it. What happened? He wanted something and he didn't control himself. He wanted it so badly that he, wouldn't, he didn't mind to think of transgressing the command of Allah in order to get it. That's one type of pressure. So today we have drugs, big problem, huge problem. People don't realize that in order to engage or participate or take those drugs, People are transgressing Allah, they're losing focus, their, their lives are becoming meaningless, meaningless. And yet they think that they're happy for a while because perhaps it's marketed in a certain way, it's the in thing. The same would apply to our identity as Muslims. Are we proud Muslims? Let's be honest, today it's not so easy or it's not as easy as it was before to tell the difference between some who are Muslim and not. Whereas there was a time when it was quite simple to tell the difference. 
it becomes so hard because why? Sometimes we are giving up this identity because of pressure. Pressure of what? Community, society, friends, everything else, the trends of today that we've seen on social media. So we give up our identity as Muslims. If that is the case, we're losing focus. The purpose of our life, the entire purpose, we're losing focus from it. We're starting to focus on things that are not actually the purpose of life, but they're supposed to be part of your living, part of your making easy your connection with Allah. We're clothed, not, not in order for us to transgress, but in order for us to get closer to Allah. Allah says, وَلِبَاسُ التَّقْوَى ذَلِكَ خَيْرٌ A verse with deep meaning. We, when we dress, there are two things. Bear Allah in mind. Be conscious of Allah when we're dressing. And when you clothe yourself with piety itself, then it's even better for you, subhanallah. So clothing, yes, while it is referring to that which is physical, it has to do with our attitude, it has to do with the way we talk and what else we do. All that is part of taqwa. It's like when Allah says, Hunna libasul lakum wa antum libasul lahunna. When it comes to your spouses, when it comes to your wives, Allah says, they are like a garment unto you. It has a deeper meaning. It doesn't mean that I take my wife and I wear her as a cloth, as a piece of cloth. No, but it has a deeper meaning, very deep meaning. In the same way, libasul taqwa has quite a deep meaning. It's referring to quite a few things. And what this goes to show, Allah will allow us to enjoy things within this world for as long as we don't lose focus. We don't lose focus of the main aim of our existence. And this is what seems to be happening. So in the next few minutes, inshallah, we will allow, uh, you know, discussion around this subject of the purpose, purposeful life and living. And there are many angles of looking at it. Sheikh Ali looked at a beautiful, beautiful angle of it. And I've just put forward also a certain angle, the challenges that we face while trying to live as Muslims, living upright, looking at society, seeing your jobs. I mean, you get a job, but to fulfill your salah is not a joke. Uh, some people say, you know, can I just go home and read all my four salah that I've missed because I was working? I mean, is it really that bad? Are you really compromising your akhirah because of the dunya? So matters of this nature, those who compromise their dress code, their morals, their ethics, their values, their duties unto Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You know, this age is an age of interest and usury. Is it, is it okay because you know, like it's tough, you know? So can't I just X, Y, and Z? Well, to be honest, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala strengthen us. We do admit and agree that there are a lot of pressure, pressures, tremendous amount of pressure on our youth and on various other uh, categories of society but we need to navigate through these tough times and that's why we're here inshallah discussing this matter so i'd like to inshallah ask the moderator to take over inshallah assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh uh, now we'll go to sheikh ali there's a popular question which alhamdulillah um, you the uh, learned scholars of our time may allah subhanahu wa ta'ala continue to make you a brilliant example has been as he has been making you and may your ending be even better than you are right now bismillah now you guys you are in the best position to answer this question a lot of people feel talking about the purpose of life following the islamic purpose which you are breaking down for us as we go along can be seen as boring to some people you are trying your best bismillah Allah is the one that accepts from us and may he accept from every single one of us you are trying your best right now to leave a perfect example. May Allah make it easy for you. How do you address this sentiment that if you try your best in this line, you're, lead, you're leading a boring life, you, everything is dark, you don't have fun. How do you address this sentiment, sir? Alhamdulillah. Um, first of all, I withdraw from myself personally the title of scholar. Jazakallah khair for your good expectations. I try to shadow them and benefit from them as every one of you is trying to do the same. As for the scholars, this is a, a different category. With regards to your question, a golden question, Akhil Karim. Indeed, somebody who is living a purposeful Islamic life is seen as gharib. Gharib being a stranger. 
And being a stranger is not a good feeling to have. Relates to what our Sheikh was speaking about, the element of identity. Everybody feels the need to have an identity. And if you are living a life of Islamic purpose and there aren't many who are sharing the same vision or upon the straight and narrow that you are upon, uh, then it becomes a little bit daunting. And thus it seems to be boring, backward, dark, lonely. However, if you were to find yourself a circle of people, say for example the brothers and sisters you have met in this convention as an example, we are all here for one purpose, and that is to glorify Allah Jalla Jalalu. And to team up, all of a sudden, working towards Allah and the home of the hereafter becomes a lot more colorful. And indeed, what is the meaning of color in the absence of Allah Jalla Jalalu in our life? And the absence of pursuing Jannah and fearing running away from the hereafter, running away from the hellfire. Here, brothers and sisters, I want to address one thing which I think may contribute to the boring outlook that some of us have towards the godly living or the purposeful, meaningful living. The aspect of understanding the term ibadah, what does worship even mean? Where Allah, he tells us, for example, وَمَا خَلَقْتُ الْجِنَّ وَالْإِنسَ إِلَّا لِيَعْبُدُونَ The only reason I have created man and the jinn is so that they may worship me. There is no other reason. Perhaps for many of us, the very first thing that comes to mind when we hear the term ibadah, worship, is bowing on prostration and the recitation of the Qur'an and fasting the long days of the summer and praying the long nights of the winter. And this is la shak min arqa and wa'al ibadah. Some of the highest levels of worship, don't get me wrong, but is it exclusive to that? And the answer is no. The scholars are teaching us that anything that a person does so long as it fulfills two criteria, in the eyes of Allah, it's an act of ibadah. What are the two conditions? Can anybody tell us the first? What is the first condition? Sorry? The niyyah, the niyyah. The intention. The intention is to glorify Allah. The intention is to please Allah. But is the intention enough? Is the intention enough? The answer is no. Some of those who blow themselves up in marketplaces, they have good intentions, believe it or not. But in the eyes of Allah, they are doomed. Ali radiallahu ta'ala anhu was killed in the name of what? Paganism? Ali radiallahu anhu was killed in the name of Islam. Abu Lu'lu'at al-Majusi was the one who killed Umar radiallahu anhu, the fire worshipper. But the killer of Ali and the killer of Uthman, they were Muslims. And they were worshippers of Allah. They were harder in worship than you and I are. Believe me. In fact, the Messenger وسلم, said to his companions, when you see how they worship Allah, you will belittle your worship in comparison to theirs. And you will belittle your Quran in comparison to them. He said, but they are the dogs of the hellfire. Yeah? So intention on its own is not enough. It is a condition. But there has to be another, which is maybe another answer from our sisters. A al mutaba compliance to the sunnah of the messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam. The intention and compliance to the sunnah of the messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam. If these two conditions are found in anything you do, guess what? In the eyes of Allah jalla jalaluhu, it is an act of worship. What did our Shaykh tell us just a few moments ago? Wa fi budhi ahadikum sadaqa. Having matrimonial relations with your spouse is a sadaqah, a charity in the eyes of Allah. But not any matrimonial relation. When the intention is there. When the intention is there. I remember speaking to a, um, a friend of mine, a teacher. And he said to me, when we were in Yemen studying with our sheikh, somebody came and knocked on the door. So I got up to open the door for the guest. Sheikh said to me, wait. Ya Fulan, so and so, what is your intention when you open the door? I said, my intention is to open the door. He said, ah, okay, you stay sat down, I'm going to open the door. He said, I felt like a thunderbolt had just hit me, what did I do wrong? Is it not what people usually intend? So he opened the door and he came back and he said to my brother, I did not mean to offend you. I asked you what your intention was. I wanted to see if you are smart enough to convert your footsteps to the door and make it an act of worship. He said to him, how? Well, he said, look at the intentions I put for this. 
I intended to walk towards my brother in order to relieve him from the sun outside. And I intended to greet him with the greeting of salam and therefore our sins, our sins they fall away. And I intended that I put my hand in his hand in musafaha in order to fulfill the sunnah of the messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam. I intended to smile in his face and therefore that will be a sadaqah on my scales. I intended to bring him into my home in order to be a generous Muslim. And he listed around 30 or 40 intentions. This is called business, huh? tijara. Some people are offended when we hear the term tijara, trading with Allah. You make it a material thing. Ya akhi, Allah uses the term tijara, trade in the Quran. We are trading with Allah. Those who recite the book of Allah. And they established a prayer. And they spend from what we have given them publicly and privately. Yarjuna what? Tijara. Yarjuna tijaratan lan tabur. They are putting their hopes in a trade that will not fail. In a trade that will not fail. Going back to the discussion, brothers and sisters, plug in the intention. Our sisters who are raising the reformers and the revivalists and the ulama. If your intention is there, what can we do to catch up with that? Brothers who are working on their sites, working as farmers, as taxi drivers, working cleaning the streets, what is your intention? Some of the scholars have said, I wish that there would be a group of scholars whose purpose in life was to teach people maqasidhum fil haya, how to set the correct intention. Halaqa for fiqh, halaqa for tafsir, halaqa for history, halaqa for Arabic language. I wish there would be a study circle where the sheikh has no purpose in life but to teach people the science of setting the intention. And in the field of alchemy, and I will conclude with this, forgive me, Sheikh. In the field of alchemy, it's a superstitious uh, science whereby they were trying to convert uh, me meaningless stones, worthless stones into gold and diamond, right? Lead into gold, yeah? It hasn't really happened till this day. But there are some people who really believe that they will reach a day when they can convert these stones into precious material. As Muslims, we have that transformer. We've always had that transformer. It's called the niyyah, the intention. It doesn't transfer uh, stone from being stone to gold. No, it transfers your worldly doings into a hasana that will remain with you forever and will bring you to Jannah. The niyyah, brothers and sisters. And that is why Mu'adh, he would say, as Bukhari narrates, inni anamu. I fall asleep at night and my intention is that Allah is going to reward me for every second I sleep the same way I hope he's going to reward me for my night prayer the Sheikh spoke about. Why? Because he has put an intention with his salah. Excuse me, he has put an intention for his sleep and therefore Allah Jalla Jalaluhu rewards him for every second that he spends or we spend snoring at night because there is an intention. With that, the concept of worship becomes colorful and dynamic and excited in the masjid and out of the masjid as well. Wallahu alam. Alhamdulillah. That was beautiful. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reward you, Ustaz. The question for Mufti is that uh, there is a conception that goes this way. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has blessed you with wealth and he has blessed you with children and he has blessed you with many other beautiful things of this dunya almost in the eyes of people nowadays is translated to Allah being pleased with you now on the other side you don't have any of these things of, we've listed or Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has not given you yet these things is also seen as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala not being pleased with you setting a purpose for your life how does he help this conception Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. I had said earlier in one of the talks, I mentioned, in fact, the talk that I just delivered, I mentioned the point of how the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam being Afdalul Khalqi wa Akramul Rusuli, he was not a wealthy man who had all the luxuries of this world. In fact, he went through more than any one of us in terms of challenge. 
That's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us again through the blessed lips of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa in what we know as hadith. And I'm sure you know the difference between Quran and hadith. They are both from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. One is sacred, the word of Allah. The other one is words of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa given by Allah, inspired by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is what we refer to when we say that Allah is telling us through the blessed lips of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa in the words of hadith. Uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has told us and it's just amazing when we read these words and we understand them inna allah idha ahabba abdan ibtalahu when Allah loves a slave he tests him or her so when you don't have tests Surely it should be reason to be a little bit concerned to say what's going on. My life is a bit too smooth here Because we will graduate One day and we will receive our certificates in a book form Known as Al-Kitab on a certain day Based on the results you will be able to get your ultimate dream of Jannah you know, I would say, if you are at school, you get one examination every month. Nowadays, they have monthly exams, right? Then one in the term that's a bit bigger than the monthly ones, and annual one which is bigger than all those put together. And then you have the qualifying ones, which are at every interval, which are even bigger. And when you graduate from that school, you go to a higher school of learning, secondary. And the same happens there. And then you go into university, it becomes more and more difficult, but you're becoming more and more excited and you spend sleepless nights in order to get a certificate of the dunya, but you won't spend the sleepless nights in order to get a certificate of the akhirah. So as we proceed, we get a certificate with the idea of getting a job. And when we, we have to leave the schools one day and go into the real life. In the same way, we have to leave this test ground known as the dunya and go into the real life known as the akhirah with the same certification and we will continue and we will progress and Allah tells us the bigger the test the bigger the reward amazing the greatness of the reward is connected to the greatness of the test just like this world if you were to sit in examination and the first question was one plus one Forget about that certificate. You don't need it. Get up and walk out. Subhanallah. But if they ask you a question that's tough, you look at it and you start sweating and your stomach starts churning. Now you know, uh oh, there's something happening here, right? So the same would apply in the dunya. Allah says, لا يغرنك تقلب الذين كفروا في البلاد. Don't be deceived by the movement of those who don't believe when they are given luxuries and the dunya thrown at their feet. And there are more than one verse that explains this. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us, don't be deceived by what we've given others. No, it doesn't mean we love them or we like them or whatever. And it's not a sign that Allah doesn't like you either. If you're a mu'min and Allah has blessed you with wealth, well, you need to know, and I'm speaking to my brothers and sisters here, if Allah has blessed you with one thing, People don't know that you have other issues. They don't know that. They think you're set. I mean, you talk about someone, they have the looks, they have the wealth, they have uh, 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 what seems to be a lovely family, etc. But you don't know. They might have health matters that you don't know. They might have some other deep burning issues that are worse than yours, but they're hidden from your eye. Allah has promised he's going to test every single one of us. You know, it's called tawkid in the Arabic language, emphasis. Allah says, and verily, definitely, indeed, without a doubt, we are going to test all of you. When Allah says you, he's referring to all of us. With what? بِشَيْءٍ مِّنَ الْخَوْفِ وَالْجُوعِ وَنَقْصٍ مِّنَ الْأَمْوَالِ وَالْأَنفُسِ وَالثَّمَرَاتِ Those are the tests. One after the other. In fact, those are only some of the tests Allah makes mention of. And the point that Allah is raising is what is mentioned after that. So Allah will test us with fear, with loss of life, with hunger, 
with loss of produce, with loss in so many things. And Allah says, وَبَشِّرِ الصَّابِرِينَ Give good news to those who are patient, those who are forbearant, those who practice restraint. When we test them, give good news to them. Good news. So don't think you are the only one going through challenges. Wallahi, we who are seated here are also going through challenges. We also have issues. Some of the issues we face perhaps are bigger than some of those you face. But with Allah, nothing is too big. If you make Allah yours, as in the main focus of your life, trust me, He will make your path easy, so easy. And where do I get this from? So many places in Revelation. Let's start with the life of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He lost his son. He lost another son. He lost his daughters. He lost his children, one after the other. He lost his spouse. He lost a wife he loved. What did he... The people passed away all around him. He was born. When he was born, he didn't have a father because his father passed away before he was born. Then he was born and his mother passed away. The, his grandfather took over. His grandfather passed away. Then his uncle took over. A day came, the uncle passed away. And the wife passed away. It was known as the year of sadness. But I have no doubt Allah loved him more than entire creation. The year of sadness came to the one whom Allah lo loves more than you and I. So that has nothing to do with, with whether Allah is pleased with you or not. Allah is pleased with those who are close to Him and who try to become even closer. Try. I said in my talk earlier, what Allah wants from you is to try in the right direction. For as long as you are trying. I spoke about salah and I want to say it again. None of us will have 100% concentration. No. So don't let that make you think because I can't concentrate, I'm not going to read salah. You know, someone came to me once and said, I can't read Salah. Why? I can't fulfill my Salah. Because I, I can't remember whether I read one or two or three or four. What did I read? I don't even know. So I said, don't worry. You're supposed to read it even more. <laughs> Subhanallah. Because those better than you had the same problem. What do you mean those better than me had the same problem? So, yeah. Didn't you read the hadith? Is, إِذَا صَلَّ أَحَدُكُمْ فَلَمْ يَدْرِ أَوَاحِدَةً صَلَّ أَمِ اثْنَتَيْنِ It's a hadith. The Prophet ﷺ says, if it, he's telling his companions, if any one of you read salah and you can't remember whether you read one or two, then this is what you should do. Why? Because it happened at the time. To people better than you and I, they were sahaba. They also sometimes lost concentration in prayer. They didn't know we did one or two. They had a doubt, do I have wudu, do I not? But they did not let the doubts control them. That's the thing. When you let the doubt control you, you lose focus completely. You become despondent. Don't. Allah is more merciful than your problem. That's why the hadith says, Fulfill your prayer standing in the proper way. If you cannot, then sitting. And if you cannot, then lying down. Why? Because Allah doesn't need that prayer. You need it. So just do it in the best way you can. Try. Same applies to my wudu. I'm going to make it in the best way I can. Not going to lose hope. Anyway, I think I'm sidetracking a little bit from what was uh, the main core of what I was saying. And that is giving you and you having things is not a sign of the pleasure of Allah. Not necessarily, but he could give you sometimes when he knows that perhaps you will do things. And taking away from you is not a sign that Allah is displeased with you. Not at all. It, both of the instances should draw you closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is why when a person has wealth, if it makes them arrogant and it makes them haughty, it, it's actually a punishment for them. Look at Qarun. When Allah describes Qarun, Allah says we gave him so much. Allah says we gave him so much of wealth that the keys, just the keys to the treasures would be heavy for a group of men to actually carry. Imagine the keys to the treasures. And then Allah says, Allah says, him and, and his whole household, his whole house, we caused the earth to swallow it. We sunk him into the ground. So there was that the pleasure of Allah. And you know what? I must mention this point now that it's come to my mind about Qarun. Allah says, 
There were people who used to say, Ya layta lana mithlama utiya Karun. Oh, I, we wish that we had what Karun has. What did he have? Trust me, he had so much. We just described. He would have been the wealthiest of the lot. If that wealth came with the arrogance of Karun, it is a punishment. And if it came with the obedience of Sulaiman, it is actually the mercy of Allah. Then when he was swallowed by the ground, you know what? In fact, prior to being swallowed by the ground, the people with knowledge, what did they say? The people with knowledge warned the others to say, hey, 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 be careful. You don't just wish what this person has like that. If it comes with haughtiness and arrogance, it's not a means of the mercy of Allah, or showing the mercy of Allah. So Allah says later on, those people who were wishing to have what Qarun had in terms of material wealth, Allah says, you know what? They said later on, and I'm just mentioning a portion of it, just as well we didn't have what Qarun had. Had we had that, Allah would have destroyed us with him as well. So that is actually a proper answer to what we're talking about to say, be happy with what Allah has given you. He knows why he kept you in your place. But one thing, materialism is taking over very fast. People really are following the latest of everything. I may be guilty of that to a certain extent. May Allah guide me. What I mean is when there's a new phone, we all want to know, hey, what about it? I, wallahi, without a joke. There's a new phone, there's a new this, there's a new handbag, there's a new perfume. How does it smell? But sister, you've got 40 perfumes on your dressing table. You've hardly touched them. Subhanallah. Clothing. For every occasion we need a new pair of clothing. I don't know if that's the culture here. In fact, here I was told the last time that when you do a photo shoot, at the same function you need three pairs of clothes. If that is the case, materialism, we are drowning with that. Cut it. That's a sign of the anger of Allah. It's called extravagance. And Allah tells us, Indeed, those who are wasteful, extravagant, etc., those who, uh, you know, just spend as they wish and will, that is tabdeer. Those who go beyond the limits, they are the brethren of the devil, of shaitan. And shaitan is ungrateful. That is ingratitude. When Allah gives you money, <laughs> you know, I thought of this in my talk, but I didn't say it. I'm saying it now. You spent three million naira on an outfit. Halal. Halal. We're not saying it's haram. Do you realize that that means you worked for almost a whole month depending on your salary or a few weeks and all that you're sweated you went to work early you came back you went you sweated you came back you did this you did that all of that that amount of time was in lieu for a piece of clothing you thought of that we missed our salah that's what people do when they go to work sometimes we gave up a lot of our deen and we earned a little bit saying, I need to earn. And you just bought a piece of clothing, which means put that piece of clothing in front of you and tell yourself, my Dhuhr, my Asr, my Maghrib, my Isha, for one month went away because I needed this piece of cloth. Have you ever thought of it that way? Same applies with your car. Look at your car every day and say, I've given up Allah so much, but Alhamdulillah, I have a car. A'udhu Billah, we wouldn't want to say that. We don't realize when we spend money, even when you eat food, we eat food, we go for a meal, but you don't, you don't know how many 20s make a hundred. You know, that they say how many dollars make a whole hundred. You don't realize, you just spent it, but take a look at who sweated behind the money. How did, that's why the hadith says one of the first things that you're going to be, you know, questioned about. 
Your salah, yes indeed. And then your money, where did you earn? Where did you spend, etc. Where is it? Where is all this sustenance we gave you? It's something you're going to leave behind in the dunya. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us from materialism. Don't rush behind that. I tried. I want to give you a small example. Uh, when you get too attached to something and it is coming between you and Allah and your heart is beginning to love it so much that it's now getting between you and Allah, you know what? Cut it. Cut it. And I'm sorry to say one thing. You know, the brothers, we are equally guilty. But with the sisters, look. Everyone wants to look good, mashallah. Mashallah, you may want to, you know, put your little eyeliner here and there, look a little bit decent, perhaps a little bit of a touch up if you'd like here and there. But, but, never choose your makeup over Allah. Never choose your makeup over Allah. I receive so many questions of people say, how can I make wudu when the value of the Mac that I used on my face is almost a hundred US dollars? I'm sure Allah will allow me to read my Dhuhr, Asr, Maghrib and Isha late at night. Wallahi, I'm only mentioning this because we receive these questions. So that sister should put the bottle of Mac in front of her and whatever other little fancies you have, put it there. And repeat in the mirror, you are more important than salah. Repeat it ten times. Wallahi, that's what we are doing. But we are not speaking about it in front of the mirror. Wallahi, we are doing it. So, I respect those who don't waste so much money on that which is the pressure of the world. Be yourself. Islam teaches you to love what Allah has made you with to love your appearance, to love what Allah has given you. You don't need to hide your identity so much. Like I said, you want to look good a little bit here and there is okay, but so much that you start thinking, subhanallah, we give up Allah because I just want to show my behind. You know, Allah's given me a behind of a good size. A'udhu billah. So I need to show the men. Imagine, imagine. And what we've done, we've given it, we, th we want the pleasure of Allah that we're talking about. And we say, but you know, I have a problem. What's the problem? Ah, is this, uh, but you can't even change your dress for Allah. You can't even make that two inches more. Two inches on either side would have been the most perfect outfit, but you needed it such that you had to show Allahu Akbar. Why? Why? May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us. I hope I've worded it in a way that can convince us just to be better people by the way. And we're not judging anyone. It's only a, a means of encouragement. And for the brothers, wait, your turn is coming. <laughs> MashaAllah, may Allah reward you, Mufti. So Ustaz, the question to you now is, I have decided, I haven't heard you speak so much about being, living the life of purpose. I've decided to leave within the means of halal and stay away from haram, do that which is permissible and enjoy my life within the limits of Allah and then stay away from the prohibitions. However, there is a huge struggle with this. I have family members that see me leaving my beard, my trouser is following the sunnah and then they think I'm becoming too... For the, for the lack of better word, I'm becoming an extremist. I have friends that are thinking, what is he doing? He's becoming a different person. How do we deal with this pressure that comes with this sacrifice? Alhamdulillah. Uh, undoubtedly, this type of feeling of being strange that we alluded to earlier uh, is a painful feeling, just as regret is again, which we spoke about earlier. Being a stranger is not a good feeling. Whether you are a stranger at school, university, or a stranger at work, worse still is when you are a stranger amidst your own community. And Imam Ibn al-Qayyim, rahmatullah alludes to this, and he says that there are two forms of ghurbah, two forms of being strange. First of all, let's zoom out a little bit. What do we mean by this term ghurbah and strange? Because we've used it several times. It's based upon a famous hadith that I'm sure you are aware of. The Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Bada al Islam Ghariba. Islam began as something strange. 
and it shall return. Look at the good news. It shall return as something strange. And therefore, I give good news to the strangers. Who are the strangers, Ya Shaykh? In another riwayah, the messenger said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, when he was asked, Who are they? He says, Alladina Yahyauna Ma Umita Min Sunnati. They are those who give life to those elements of my Sunnah that had been killed. They give life to those elements of the Sunnah that are no longer being observed within their localities. So based upon that premise, Imam Ibn Al-Qayyim says there are two types of strangeness, ghurbah. A strangeness where you are between non-Muslim community. You are a believer amidst others who are worshipping more than one Allah or not worshipping Allah at, at all. And so all of a sudden, monotheism is seen as backward and retarded, regressive, and it's not really up to date with modern day discoveries and so on and so forth. That's a ghurba, a strangeness that can be dealt with. However, the real tough one is when you are a strange amidst who? Amidst who, dear brothers and sisters? Amidst Muslims, amidst your own. So all of a sudden, your growing of the beard is looked at as being backward and retarded and regressive. Your wearing of the Islamic hijab. That qualifier is important, I think, as Sheikh is alluding to. The Islamic version of the hijab. Again, you will have all sorts of labels. However, there is some good news according to the Quran. That a person who finds himself, herself, on the receiving end of these harsh words for trying to glorify Allah, it's a sign of your iman. And what is the evidence for this? Allah Jalla Jalaluhu said, إِنَّ الَّذِينَ أَجْرَمُوا كَانُوا مِنَ الَّذِينَ كَانُوا مِنَ الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا Everyone said it. آمَنُوا يَضْحَكُونَ Indeed, the criminals, they used to laugh at the believers. Indeed, the criminals, they used to laugh at who? Allah says, the people of Iman. So it's a wonderful sign that you are a person of Iman. And it's a sign that you are now upon the path of the prophets and messengers. And this is point number two. For those who are seeking inspiration and they are fearing that their steadfastness is going to take a bit of a hit sooner or later because it's too much. The answer according to the Quran is what? Look at the lives of those before you. This actually is a Quranic methodology in dealing with that feeling of being strange and different and outcast and an outsider. The Quranic methodology is one that says, stop looking at yourself. Stop crying over yourself. Look at those before you. This is a Quranic methodology and it is a prophetic methodology. And take the evidence for both. In terms of it being a Quranic methodology, look at Surah Hud. Yeah? Allah Jalla Jalaluhu mentions to our messenger alayhi salatu wasalam the story of Hud and the story of Salih and the story of Shuhayb and the stories of the prophets who are subjugated by their communities are harmed and insulted and ridiculed and laughed at. And then look now at the, the, towards the end of the surah. What does Allah say? This is the summary of the surah. Allah says, وَكُلَّنْ نَقُصُّ عَلَيْكَ مِنْ أَنْبَاءِ الرُّسُلِ مَا نُثَبِّتُ بِهِ فُؤَادَكَ Allah says, we relate to you the stories of these messengers in order to give steadfastness to your heart. So when you approach the topic of stories of the Prophet, قَصَصُ الْأَنْبِيَاءِ Don't see it as a topic, brothers and sisters, where the mashayikh, the scholars, are running away from reality. They don't want to talk about politics. They don't want to talk about the difficult elements of life like narcissism and secularism and modernism and liberalism and feminism. So they're running away to the stories of the prophets. Ya akhi, that's not the situation. According to the Quran, those who are feeling like an outcast because of these isms, go back to the story of the prophets and see how they were labeled and see how the last round always belonged to them. This is the Quranic methodology. We said it is also a prophetic methodology, i.e. the methodology of reminding you of those who suffered before you. As our Sheikh alluded to, when you feel that you are the only person on planet Earth suffering, you will suffer. But when you realize that the suffering of the one who does not glorify Allah, 
despite the smiles and the facades of happiness, is suffering many more times than you, O monotheist. You say, Alhamdulillah, my suffering is for the Akhirah, and their, and their suffering is for what? Yes, laysu sawa, and they are not equal. So what is the evidence for the prophetic methodology, the stories of the past? Do you remember when the Messenger وسلم, was approached by a companion very early in the seerah, the Messenger وسلم, was leaning or reclining in the shade of the Kaaba, and the companion laqiya min al The poor companion had suffered so much at the hands of the criminal pagans. And he said to the Messenger وسلم, Ala tastansiru lana? Ala tad'u lana? Will you not ask Allah to make dua for us? Will you not ask Allah to give us support and victory? Don't you see our suffering? And he, he was suffering. The Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam got up. What did he say to him? I'm going to remind you of the people of the past. How did he alleviate his feeling of being strange? How did he help him find dignity and strength and honor in being a stranger and to be proud and to raise your head high? He reminded him of the story, the stories of the past. He said, كَانَ الرَّجُلُ فِي مَنْ كَانَ قَبْلَكُمْ يُؤْتَى بِهِ يُحْفَرُ لَهُ فِي الْأَرْضِ وَيُوضَعُ الْمِنْشَارُ عَلَى مَفْرِقِ رَأْسِهِ ثُمَّ يُنْشَرُ بِالْمِنْشَارِ وَيُنْشَطُ بِأَمْشَاطِ الْحَدِيرِ مَا دُونَ لَحْمِهِ وَعَظْمِهِ مَا يَصُدُّهُ ذَلِكَ عَنْ دِينَ He said there used to be people in the past who had a ditch dug up for them because they were Muslims. And they would be put inside of the ditch. And they would be cut from head to toe in half using a saw. And others, they would be combed using combs of iron. Allahu Akbar. Combs of iron, removing their muscle and their flesh from their bones. It would not push him away from the path of Allah. And then he said, Wallahi la yutimman Allahu hadha al-amr. Allah is going to fulfill this affair. Allah is going to perfect the religion of Islam till the traveler will travel from such and such place to such and such place. Had san'a, had ramot. Not fearing anybody except Allah and fearing perhaps the wolf for his, for his sheep. In other words, it will be security. It will be the deen of Allah Jalla Jalaluhu. Brothers and sisters, if you are feeling somewhat strange, give attention to the biography of the people of the past. And therefore, this will be your ammunition to deal, to deal with your future. Thank you so much. Jazakallah khairan. Uh, lastly, just uh, for the Mufti to give us an advice based on this topic. Our mothers are here, our sisters are here, our brothers are here, and our fathers are here. And a part of this purpose we're speaking about is the, uh, settling down and having a spouse, and then having a husband, and then building towards the same life together. How can you help advise us within maybe five minutes, six minutes, on how to achieve this success together with each other. Isn't it? They always seem to be asking me the marriage questions. Mm. <laughs> I'll bring you on yourself, yes, yes. May Allah make it easy. My beloved brothers and sisters, it's not an easy topic. The more difficult we make marriage, the less barakah there will be in our lives. The Prophet ﷺ has asked us to make it easy for others. The Prophet ﷺ has asked those who have daughters and sisters and, and, and women in their guardianship to say, if someone proposes and comes forth with decent, reasonable character, reasonable deen, let it happen. The difficulty with us, we make nikah so difficult that we facilitate adultery and zina. That's what happens. We facilitate adultery because we don't realize that by making halal hard, you make haram simple and easy. By putting an obstacle in the face of halal, you are a vehicle and a tool of making haram something that is probably looked at as the only way out for the young. So when the mahar or the sadaq, as they call it, is very high, it becomes a problem. Yesterday, I officiated two nikah here in Abuja. I was the Imam officiating. I told them I don't want to know the Sadaq. They said, what do you mean? I said, have you agreed? 
Look at it. You agreed? We agreed. You agreed? We agreed. Witnesses, we have agreed? Nisadaq? Yes. I don't need to know. It's not a competition. We don't want to tell people 50,000, 5,000, 10,000, 2,000, 1,000, or 100. I don't want to tell them. We say, have you accepted her in your marriage with the sadaq you have agreed upon in the presence of the witnesses? And the answer will come, yes, that's enough. But we make it a big thing in some communities. I'm not too sure about here, but I was just saying something that I know for many years. Some communities, they are excited to say, how much, how much was it, how much was it? They say, ah, 15 million. I say, what? 15 million, woohoo, when I get married, it'll be 20. It becomes a, a competition. You know, the Prophet Sallam, he taught us not to be, you know, to try and have the least expense. Don't be extravagant. Don't set the bar so high that everyone needs to marry. You have to have this function and that function and before the marriage and during the marriage and after the marriage and so on. And you have to have a function here. Then you've got to travel to Jordan and have one there. Then you've got to go to America and have one there. All that cut it for the sake of Allah. You want barakah in your life? Have a simple wedding where Allah and his Rasul are the main, main focus. Main focus. So people are saying, talk to us about settling down. I've spoken to young, young boys here in Nigeria and a few of the, the, the girls that I've had the opportunity of uh, asking as well. The biggest problem is it's not easy to get married. That's what they say. It's tough. You know, we look for men who are wealthy already. And yet when we got married, there was no wealth in our pockets. Mm. Marriage age is once you're majority age of majority there's no fixed age in islam to say you have to be this age or some once you according to the norm of your society are ready to get married alhamdulillah you're ready perhaps we would like to look at it anywhere between 18 20 21 there's no fixed age actually but it changes with the changing of time based on several factors at the moment we're looking at approximately i'd like to think 20 is a good age but people might go a little bit this way that way that is an age that you are sexually perhaps at a level where you need the opposite sex now in your life, right? And to be very fair, you would not have even started a living, earning a living properly. To be very fair. Why did Allah keep it that way? That I need to marry at about 20, but I wouldn't really... So that the two of you can grow together, you can do ibadah together, you can actually... Uh, earn, you know, with one another's help and assistance in this way or that way you can grow and then you appreciate what you've earned, you appreciate the children you have and so much more. That's one of the reasons. There are many other reasons, some we may know, some we may not know. But if Allah really wanted that a man must be very, very wealthy before he gets married, then the rule would be that if when you are 20, you can only marry a man who's 70. That would be the rule. Because by that time you have money. By that time you are settled, you can spoil your, your wife. But Allah wants you to taste what life is all about. Allah wants you to go through the challenges. How many of the slightly older mothers that we have here, back in the day, they, they were struggling, struggling. I know in my own life back in the day, you know, we, we didn't have it easy going. And over time, my parents didn't own a house for years on end. And even a car, it was something that came years later. And today a car is a condition of the children of the same people who didn't have cars. And a phone, wallahi, and everything. And you didn't, you know, you ask them, so when did you buy your house? They say, ah, 20 years after marriage we afforded it. But my son-in-law, he needs two houses. Mm. One holiday house in wherever, and the other one here, and so on. And you need to have this and that. Come on, don't make it tough. So when you speak of marriage, you need a whole conference on marriage, actually. And I believe there's going to be one happening here sometime in April. Uh, a major international marriage conference of a very high standard is coming here. I think one ummah is partnering in that. So at that juncture, they will address this topic perhaps a little bit better. And they're going to be specialists from across the globe coming to talk about marriage here. I was just telling the brother today that I think in Abuja, they're going to need a whole 10 times this size when you're talking of marriage, because they are going to come. And one of the highlights of that is they actually do matchmaking, subhanAllah. They actually do matchmaking in a very professional way. I haven't seen exactly how it works, but I believe from some of my colleagues that it's done in a really professional way, properly done with guidance and guardianship and whatever. However, 
This topic, as you've seen, I've only discussed one aspect of it, and that is the aspect of making it easy. Together with that, you look at the divorce rate. How high is it? Extremely high. Extremely high. Today, someone told me that in northern Nigeria, divorce is extremely high. I said, stop blaming northern Nigerians. Don't say that. It's all over the world. It's not just unique to your place. Because we've become materialistic. We put so much pressure. And our focus is materialism. We've lost character, conduct, and we've lost the connection with Allah. So, on either side, we want, 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 want this, want that, want that. If it's not there, ah, I'm not happy in my marriage. Why? Ah, that uh, Gucci, he didn't even get it for me. I'm not happy in your marriage, Gucci. I, don't, I stopped wearing a watch. People say, you know, how come you don't, you don't wear a watch? I said, because I can tell the time from my phone. The phone has actually done us a lot of favors. You know that? This smartphone is really smart. You know why? You don't need a camera. You don't need a, all these big machines you see here. We can replace them with this little phone. You don't need a watch. You don't need a calculator. You know, so many things you don't need all on the phone. The sad thing is, some people say, well, I don't need a wife also because on the phone. Audhu billah. That's wrong. So we need to know what we should be replacing and what not. But my beloved brothers and sisters, it's a beautiful topic. Let's develop our character. Many of us fail. When you get married, I challenge you to be the best husband you could ever be. It is worth it for one woman to say, what a lovely man. And for the whole world to think you're a nice guy, but they know who this guy is here. Behind the scenes, he's a real, you know, uh, problem. Uh, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us ease and goodness. There's one quick point that I thought of regarding the previous uh, question that was uh, addressed to my colleague. You know, when your family gives you problems, for uh, as you become more and more religious, I've had people who've become Muslims and their families have not accepted it and they've been very angry and upset. And what's the advice I give them? A lot of advice, but one quick point that, that will be helpful. Develop your character and conduct to such a high degree that in a short space of time, they will see this is the better person, a better version of the person than it was, than they were before. And they will begin to appreciate your closeness to Allah. Because some of us, as we get closer to Allah, we become arrogant. We start saying to our own family members, you, you're going to Jahannam. I mean... Who gives you the authority to say that? If that is the case, then you are a part of the problem. Piety and God consciousness comes with leniency and soft nature. Remember that. You want to gauge a person's piety, even your own. Ask yourself, how lenient and soft have I become? And how do I address others and so on? Yes, when it comes to myself, I'm hard. I have to be hard. I'm going to try and do things proper. But for others, I'll talk, I'll try, I'll smile, I'll talk, I, I'll try my best with this one, that one, etc., etc. And that's a sign of real closeness to Allah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us forgiveness. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless you all. I'm really, really impressed by uh, the brothers and sisters who have attended all day today. And I'm really looking forward to tomorrow as well. And I pray that we have a very successful event. These events are a gift of Allah for us to go back and recheck and rejuvenate and you know uh, like they say when you've lost the path on a Garmin you know on the GPS system the uh, the voice says uh, recalculating have you heard that recalculating so we are here recalculating if we've lost the path a little bit we're going to take that U-turn and inshallah we're going to go back yes, to the right direction may Allah grant us Jannatul Firdaus Aqulu Qawli Hadha Wassalamu Alaikum Wa Rahmatullah Wa Alaikum Wa Rahmatullah Wa Barakatuh